Hi, I'm Jeremy Nicholas and welcome to the After Dinner Show. This is episode 18. I've been doing it every Wednesday during lockdown. I've got some brilliant guests tonight. Let's say hello to Sue Evans, who's a professional speaker and well-being specialist who celebrates her Lancashire roots with a love of clogs. Hi, Sue. Peter, Hi, Jem. Hi. Peter Edge is a failed dentist, a career cop and after dinner speaker with a love of cooking and spaghetti westerns. Hi, Peter. Hi, Jem. And Anise Kizzlebash is an author and speaker on mindful selling and mindfulness, host of Coffee and Wisdom. She's a recovered salesperson. Hi, Anise. Hello. Hi. Right, okay, so just what is Coffee and Wisdom? Oh, it's a YouTube show that I, every Wednesday, I post silly videos on wellness. Fantastic. Okay, and Peter, why do you love cooking and spaghetti? Well, I, I, spaghetti westerns is because I, I, I studied spaghetti westerns at university um, uh, as part of my final year dissertation. So yeah. I got to sit at home and watch Clint Eastwood shoot people for uh, for about nine months, um, and I managed to convince a tutor that it was a worthwhile thing to do. So result, fantastic. And Sue, why do you love clogs? Um, partly because a, a band that I have been following for nearly 30 years set it off, but it turns out that I've got my nan's original pair that she was wearing well into her 60s. Fantastic. Okay, just take, take me through your background because you're in uh, Birkenhead, which I've been to a few times. It doesn't look much like... No, it doesn't look like this. This is me prepping for my holidays, which also won't look like this because we're going to die. <laughs> Fantastic. And Peter, you're just across the water in Prescott. Yeah, Prescott sits between Liverpool and St. Helens. So it has a bit of an identity crisis. You know? Yeah, I, I've never heard of it. I thought it was a person, Prescott, but it's a, it's a place. Well, it? you'd be surprised how many people spell it with two T's and it should only be one T. But the good news is we are soon to have a Shakespearean theatre in Prescott because apparently uh, the Bard quite liked it here. Fantastic. And yeah. uh, uh, did he? He, li he liked it. The Bard oh, did. Obviously. Yeah, as you like it, yeah. Yeah, as you like it. Brilliant. And Anise, you're in Greenwich, and I know exactly where that is in South East London. Um, and I was on a, on a tour the other day along the river, well, b before lockdown, and the guide was uh, n clearly not British, and they pronounced it Greenwich. Over here you can see Greenwich. And I thought, what, what sort of guide to London would it be that calls Greenwich Greenwich? <laughs> so... Um, I was forced to throw them overboard. Right, has everyone got um, a, a good, true live story? Yes, fantastic. Yeah. Right. Let's go first with, uh, let's go to our desert island and go to Sue. So your, what's your story going to be? About? Story. I should have found a snowy background, really, because my, my story is about taking my daughter to, to meet Father Christmas. Um, she was only four, and um, it was actually a story inspired by one which uh, Jeff Ram told about taking his kids to visit one of his Star Wars heroes who had the kid in tears, and I was like, yeah, we nearly had that. Um, we, we'd had a few shaky experiences with Father Christmas when she was really tiny, because all of a sudden, you know, plunking her with this strange guy, but we thought, no, we'll take the risk. Mm. It was a bit of a challenging trip because it started off that we'd all got on the plane. So there's this plane load of parents with really little, very excited kids. Um, and they shut Manchester Airport because it had snowed. So bearing in mind one of the places that we're heading to is probably one of the snowiest places on earth. To be stuck at the airport because it snowed was a bit <laughs> ironic, really. And we did manage to keep them entertained. And um, the first day on the trip, um, it's, a bit, it's a bit challenging if you're not great with the cold. So the locals are just sort of wandering around in jeans and a puffer jacket. <laughs> we counted, uh, not counting individual socks and gloves, 24 garments. So we were layered up like Mr. Michelin and it was still cold. It was minus 40 on the first day. Okay. Mm. And uh, the day we went into the Arctic Circle itself, we, we got over the disappointment that you can't build with Lapland snow because it's too cold. And of course, what do British kids want to do in snow? They want to build snowmen. Mm. Um, but they got a really nice habit of piling huge piles of it up at the side of the road. So she consoled herself with running up and down the piles and making vertical snow angels. That worked well. But you go to, to Santa's village and there's this really weird experience because of course you get to queue for everything. So you're queuing to go and meet Father Christmas and they give you this laminated menu. Now bearing in mind, you've already paid an absolute fortune for this trip. Mm. 
you then give them the option of paying another like 25 euros or whatever it was for a present from Santa, whereupon you give them this laminated menu to choose from. And so if you're trying to look at this menu and occupy your kid and direct the attention away and whatever. So we chose what, what Santa was going to give her. And uh, we went in and we met him and you're in there for all the 30 seconds while you get your photograph and everything. And uh, it was all great because they had ice slides outside and whatever as well. And uh, all passed very well. She was very polite to him and didn't try and pull his beard or anything. And we got home and my friend's little girl had been to see Father Christmas. And my, my, my oh so wise four year old took us to one side and went, don't think it's real, you know. And I was like, oh no, we spent all that money to take her over there and now she doesn't think it's real. I said, what's not real? She said, well, when you think about it, there's kids up and down the whole of the country who were meeting Father Christmas at the same time. So that can't be real. I was like, oh no, that's it, illusion blown. She's four and already she doesn't believe. She went, what I met the real. <laughs> she was so happy lovely and what um gift did she get we got her a little reindeer that she's still got it didn't fall apart um and the day after we did actually go to a reindeer farm and have a reindeer sleigh well sleigh stroke pallet ride um so that kind of made the reindeer really special as well I well it did it, it did farm. until grander than i had reindeer for dinner and then that ah, kind yeah. of <laughs> That's what I'm yeah, we had a rainbow reindeer burger. <laughs> yes, she wouldn't try it. <laughs> and how old is is your daughter now? She's now nearly fifteen. Right, and she's still got that reindeer. She has. Yeah. What age do children stop stop believing in Father Christmas then? It varies. I mean, I think I was about five. I think she was about six, six, maybe seven. It, she never really came out with, right, that's done. We can drop the pretense now because um, she's an only one. So it wasn't like we had to keep the pretense up for younger ones or whatever. Yeah. Um, I, I know of a few who prolonged it for longer on the belief that you get better presents if you still keep up the charade. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, um, let's um, let's go to the other people for their stories, but we'll come back to you for some clog news, I think, later. You might even be able to show us one of your clogs. I always like it when people have things to hold up. <laughs> um, so we'll come to you in a minute, Anise, but let's go to Peter. Now, Peter's a, a retired police... How long were you in the police, Peter? 30 years. 30 years. And what, what sort of policeman were you? Every sort. Um, I, I, I started off in uniform, like lots of people do. Uh, went into vice back into uniform, into CID. I was a senior investigating officer and I finished my career um, coordinating the policing and security response around um, political party conferences. So like the annual Conservative conference or the annual Labour conference, when they had them in Liverpool. I'd say that they, the Conservatives never came to Liverpool. Um, I can't understand why, um, but Labour certainly did and, and the Lib Dems did, but the Lib Dems came in 2010 uh, when all of a sudden they became a party of government, of course, the coalition government. Mm. And so the whole security operation went woof through the roof. Um, and so that was, that was my last job in the police. But yeah, I've done a bit of everything really. Other than traffic, I can safely say I have never in 30 years issued a fixed penalty ticket to anyone for anything. Oh, that's... I'm immensely proud of that. Yeah, because, so is there, a, is there a real hierarchy? Like presumably the ones that are in uniform, the ones out, the plainclothes ones look down on them. Do they, do they, uh, do they call them? Um, and I think there is an element of that. Yeah, yeah, there is, there is an element of, you know, the, the, the sort of, uh, the, the CID, the, the, the Sweeney down where you are, you know, they, they look down on plod as they call them. Um, but, you know, a career like mine that went sort of from uniform into CID, back to uniform, into plain clothes, back to uniform, into the CID again, it, it didn't really bother me. But. So tell us a story about the sort of things that people will say to a man in uniform. Well, it might be a bit risque, but this takes me back to when I was a uniform inspector, a newly promoted uniform inspector in Toxteth in Liverpool. Now, Toxteth, for those of you who don't know, is a small fishing village on the Liverpool Riviera. Um, and, and I was, as I say, newly promoted, and at half past eight in the morning, I was driving along Hope Street, 
famous street in Liverpool. I had a bright new uniform. I was in a bright new van. The sun was shining, the flowers were blooming, the birds were singing. And I was driving along Hope Street in the lee of the one of the largest Gothic cathedrals in Europe. And Hope Street also at the time had the, 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 the doubtful, um, I, I, I suppose, claim of being the red light district in Liverpool. And at half past eight in the morning, into the road in front of my van, steps Margaret Mary Ryan, a common prostitute by virtue of her previous convictions, your worships, and a woman for whom the term urban splash takes on a completely different meaning. And at half past eight in the morning, she stepped into the middle of the road. She had one arm in plaster. She had one leg in plaster. She was on crutches. And in a good hand, she had a can of Tenant's Extra Special Lager. And at half past eight in the morning, she offered me oral sex. Now, I only usually have porridge, to tell you the truth, but um, she was very disappointed, very disappointed. Uh, and her disappointment grew when we realised that there was a no bail warrant out for her as well, which she found particularly ungrateful given the generosity of her first offer. So, um, so yeah, that's the sort of thing you get offered when you're a man in uniform. Well, that you were very, very lucky. What a what a marvelous thing! And you you declined the offer, as they always oh, as they always course. say in the exposés in the tabloids. Yes. Made my excuses yeah. and left. Yes, made my excuses and left. Made yeah. my excuses actually and executed the no bail warrant that was outstanding for her, which um, she didn't like. And I'm surprised you remember her middle name as well. Well, it, it's one of those policey things, you know. I can remember registration numbers from thirty years ago and places where people live it's just one of those things you get into the the the, the gist of remembering that um, about some people <laughs> and particularly people who make a particular impression on you you know <laughs> she's not an easily forgettable woman really and do you keep in touch still um she she occasionally sends a christmas card but um no no we we, we have to uh, we have to go our separate ways after that okay well i think we've got a theme of misdemeanors let's go live now to greenwich <laughs> for a story from South East London, but about the Middle East, Anise. So I used to live in Dubai and I was driving to work one day. Now at the time, the, the road that I had to drive on would meet the main Sheikh Zayed Road. Are you familiar with that main artery that runs right through Dubai? Yeah, yeah. So I'd have to wait about half an hour on this side road before I, you get on the highway. And I was finally approaching my turn to, to go, get on the highway. And in the rear view mirror, I could see, there's only a two lane road, one way out, one way in. And I could see it, um, dirt in the, in the side view mirror. This car was tearing down on the wrong side of the road, cutting past everyone. And you can hear these horns beeping one by one, one by one. And she tried to cut in front of me. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to do everyone a service and myself and not let her in. So I edged a bit forward, I edged a bit forward, so there wasn't much room to get in front of me. So she then edged to try and cut behind and they wouldn't let her in and then put the one behind, no one was letting her in. It was now my turn to then exit onto the highway. So the lady comes and pulls in front of me so I couldn't move. So I'm sitting there and then she gets out of the car. I was like, ooh. And I locked the doors and then I turned the volume up just so I can't hear anything. And the lady walks over and she's standing next to me and she's gesticulating and she's, she's looking a bit angry, not surprisingly. And then, uh, so I sort of didn't pay too much attention. Then she goes back and just before she sits in the car, she's about to shut the door and she gives me the finger. Now in Dubai, because they're so lovely there, giving the finger is you could go to jail for that. You know, there's been lots of stories about expats who didn't know that. Anyway, so she, she, she hid it, gave me the finger, and then that was that. So I drove off, I went to work, I thought few crises averted. About an hour later, I get a call on my mobile and it's the Dubai, Bird Dubai police station. They said, come to the police station. Well, oh, oh, okay. I, I had no idea what that was about. So I went to the police station looking around like, where am I supposed to go? And there I see the lady, the, the lady from the traffic incident earlier. So the policeman beckons me over, he says, come sit down. He said, uh, tell me what happened. 
So I explained the incident, da, 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 and then I ended with, and then she gave me the finger and shut the door. Mm. And the lady goes, no, no, she gave me the finger. Mm. I went, what? And the policeman said, she said, you gave her the finger. I said, no, I didn't. He said, well, if she gave you the finger, why didn't you call the police? I said, look, you guys are really busy, you know, <laughs> and I have to go to work. And then I said, well, how did you, I asked the lady, well, tell them, how did I give you the finger? You were sitting there doing this. And I said, um, well, everyone can see me. I'm not silly enough to do that. Well, you were doing like this then. And I said, wait, so how did you see me if you were over there? You speak to me in Arabic or French. Don't speak to me in English. And then turned to the policeman. The policeman said, Khalas, we leave it to the judge. I went, huh? Khalas, you know, you, you know just leave it to the judge and I thought oh no mm. I was about to get up and go and then the next uh, I suppose they would create you know have, make appointments so I said I was about to leave and I said listen it's Ramadan I'm fasting he said you're fasting yes can't you smell my breath <laughs> I'm fasting and why can't we forgive and forget and then he looked at me and he looked at the lady he says something in Arabic and she gets up and walks off and that was that. <laughs> Crisis averted. Oh. We I, forgave and forget. <laughs> yeah. And were you, were you fasting or had you made that up? No, no, I was fasting. All oh, right. And yeah. do, I don't know really about fasting, but does it make your breath go bad then? Uh, it, it can, because you're not allowed to drink water either. Aren't you? You can't drink water. You can't eat from sunrise to sunset. Oh, that sounds like quite a strict system. I mean, the eating, fair enough, but it's a hot country, isn't it? It is, but you're mostly in air-conditioned room, so that's not so bad. Yeah, okay. So why do you think that lady did that to you? Um, maybe she was upset. <laughs> yeah, could be. Anyway, let's ask her now because she's our surprise guest. <laughs> 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 she's here in Isleworth tonight. Surprise, <laughs> surprise. Yeah. Hi, Habibdi. <laughs> surprise, surprise, Scylla. <laughs> Did you ever meet Scylla, Peter, being from... Uh, no, no, um, I'm afraid not. Uh, I, I, I don't rub, rub shoulders with all of these Liverpool celebrities. So. What about you, Sue, from across the water? Did you ever wave at Scylla? I didn't. Hmm. Okay. I think I was probably in Wales at the time that she was uh, out and about quite a lot. All oh, right, OK. I, I, we're not going to get any mileage out of this uh, Scylla thing, so let me quickly just tell you my Dubai <laughs> thing. I've... I've <laughs> I'll go down the Scylla route. Surely one of the people from Merseyside can help me out with the Scylla story. Yeah, because, like, you know, we all know each yeah. other. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, people always say, whenever I'm abroad, people say, do you know the Queen? Because she lives in London. And I've, you know, I've been held up in traffic jams when the Queen has whizzed by at Marble Arch. I've sat and... But, think of, but I've never spoken to the woman. So. Great admirer, but it was uh, nice. Do you see that socially distanced picture of uh, Beatrice's wedding? That was lovely, wasn't it? When you had the Queen and Philip, and then Beatrice and her Italian count chappy, and there was a big gap in the middle. And you thought that should have been. At least they didn't make them wear masks, though. <laughs> no, but I thought. Imagine that, that on your wedding photos. <laughs> Yeah, fancy making a bride wear a veil. That'd be awful, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. Some sort of face covering. That wouldn't just not tradition, is it? Having a covering over your face. Yeah. You, you need to start worrying when they start asking whether you know uh, Prince Andrew. That's uh, that's the one. Well, I think that's what that gap in the middle was. It wasn't yeah. <laughs> social. It wasn't for health reasons. It was like, that's where Andrew would take out. It wasn't such a naughty boy. Uh, oh, the Queen went a bit life of Brian. <laughs> He's not the Messiah, no. He's a very naughty boy. Um, anyway, I was going to tell you about Dubai, yes. Yeah, so I, I've done quite, hosted quite a lot of award shows in Dubai. And um, I did one for the HR Awards. And it was, you know, that big palm that sticks out into the thing. And at the end of that, there's a really fancy hotel. And it, and it was in that. I can't remember what it was called. Uh, the Sofitel one or something, I think. Um, Dantis. The Atlantis, yeah, that's it. It's the really big one it's, as you drive out to sit, yeah. So I was hosting this event there and um, they were chief finance officers. And I always say to people, when you come up to collect your award, come up this way and then you'll greet the person there and they'll shake hands and then they'll present you with your trophy. Have I got a trophy lying around? No, not really. It's behind my green screen, but let's imagine that's a trophy. It's not, it's a paperweight. 
Uh, and then shake hands, have your picture taken, and then go off that way. So you come up these stairs, go off that stairs. Now, in all my years of hosting things, award shows, you always tell them that, come up that way, picture here, off that way. And, and when they win, they go, ah! and they come climbing up the front of the stage or they come off the other way. But these chief finance officers, they did it exactly like I said. They came on that way, did it, went that way. And in the end, I, I said, I've, in all my years of hosting awards, I've never known people obey my instructions. And they said, but we're finance officers, so we always comply with the regulations. You know, we're very good. At <laughs> and then literally, I was back in Dubai. About two weeks later, I went back and I hosted an HR conference and it was Bedlam. They were, they were literally just running up the stage, tripping over. You know, you'd say just send up one person of your company, the whole table would come. When you're doing the next awards, they were all go, ah. So there we are. That's HR versus chief finance officers. I know which I prefer. <laughs> Actually, I don't know. I think it's easier with the finance officers, but the HR ones, the party was better afterwards. <laughs> right, let's see what you've got to show me. Uh, have you got some cl a clog or maybe two clogs, Sue? Have you? Yes, she I has. have. On her clog well, let me just from the selection so yes these <laughs> these are over 100 years old oh i think so they, these are the ones that my nan used to have that she was wearing as i say well into her 60s proper solid wood right. um i have two pairs of my own one of which is steelies so i was known when i used to work um, in manufacturing i'd have my steelies made to measure and apparently i was known all the way through our american sister company as the clog lady Mm. We'd have people coming over, and yeah, I'd never met them. I'd no idea who they were, and they'd be like, oh, "Clog lady." <laughs> Nobody knew my name. That's just how I was known. Um, and we even had a pair made for our wedding cake. Oh, fantastic! So yeah, we we had uh, a little pair of clogs with sugar flowers, with the red roses for Lancashire and the the daffodils for Wales, mm. um, which I still have. Oh, lovely. Just oh. hold that up again so we can have a really good look in, inside them. Because you said they're 100 years old, but they look absolutely like new, don't they? Yeah, well, no, they don't if you see them. And the leather, the leather is a little but bit... Only the soles of those, then. I mean, they've never been worn outside, have they? Yeah. They've, they've been resold a lot of times. Um, I'm not sure how often the rubbers were redone. The wood, I mean, that would have been sort of pine colour originally. Yeah. But it's, you know, quite black. Yeah, well, that's but very... Yeah. She had the sense not to have irons on them at least, that they're lethal. Yes. I know a few people who got clogs with irons and it's, uh, it's like having ice skates on. When I very first got mine, it was icy that weekend. So learning to walk on solid wood on ice is not fun. <laughs> that took some practice. Nice. So irons is what you call them if they've got bits of metal on the bottom of it, is it? Yeah. Yeah, when you know when in the um, the L.S. Lowry song where they were talking about kids on the corner sparking clogs. Oh, he painted Salford smoky that, top. Go on, yeah. From the so shop, you actually get horseshoes, so you can get them made. I'm not sure if they still do them now because people used to kick each other with them and things. But trust me, they're fairly lethal anyway. Mine have got a little brass plate on the front. What does that say? Uh, it doesn't. It's oh, right. just a little <laughs> toe plate. <laughs> I don't know why these clogs belong to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> HMS Sue Evans, like it was a ship or yeah, something. Yeah, I'm a little bit past needing name labels on things now. <laughs> but I didn't know, you know, maybe left and right would have been quite useful. Maybe. Yeah, no, trust me, you could not get those on the wrong foot. <laughs> okay, now, uh, Peter, your spaghetti western. Um, have you have you got something some bit of paraphernalia that you can hold up maybe clint eastwood's hat or something um, not clint eastwood's hat but yeah so as i say I, I i was lucky enough to win a scholarship to go to university halfway through my police career and in my final year i did a dissertation the title of which was sergio leone's dollars trilogy and the classical hollywood western replacement or revival of a genre uh, and i was when i returned from my degree back into the policing world um, I was telling a colleague of mine about this and uh, I was saying, you know, this, this is the work that I did on the spaghetti westerns. And he said, well, what did you use as your classical Hollywood western to compare them to? And I said, well, I used probably the best western ever, which is Shane, you know, with Alan Ladd and Van Heflin and Jack Lance. And he said, all oh, right, that's really interesting. And about two months later, he called me into his office and he said, Peter, I've got something for you. I said, well, go on, Tom, what is it? And he 
gave me this photograph, which you may or may not be able to see, is a photograph of Jack Palance. Oh, and yeah. it says, Peter, here's wishing you the best. And on the back is a photograph of my colleague Tom and Jack Palance in his old age, just after he'd signed it with the photograph that's on the front. And I made up with that. That's lovely, isn't it? That's weird. I always think when people from Liverpool say made up. I was oh, sorry. <laughs> no, that's, but I tell you what it makes me think. I mean, it's, it's, you can say what you want. It's, you know, you're part of the world. You can have your own quirks. But when you say, uh, <laughs> when they say, oh, oh our, our kid was made up, I always imagine they've got like a pretend brother. <laughs> yes. <laughs> are, you, are you thinking made up? So like imaginary friends. What did I say? Yeah. I was thinking like a pretend brother. Yeah, he's made up. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like Harvey the rabbit, you know, an imaginary friend. Of <laughs> yeah, I have got a signed copy of everything I wrote by Ronnie Barker. Oh, right. copy. I got it on eBay and it said it was signed by Ronnie Barker. And I love Ronnie Barker it's, and it's everything he wrote because he was one of the, the writers on the two Ronnies. And it wasn't until he retired that Ronnie Corbett found out that Ronnie Barker was the main writer. Did you know? <laughs> really? Yeah, because he used a, a pen name. Yeah, I know he had a pen name, but I didn't realise it was that secret. Yeah. Oh, he's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Um, yeah, his pen, I mean, was, um, his pen name was Mont Blanc. <laughs> <laughs> Does that work? Do I use that again? I don't know. I like Mont Blanc. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Yeah. Do you remember him doing the one on the news where he ended, and he ended up, you know where they, they come out, they, they sow this seed and this story that comes up, and it said, police are on the lookout for... A rootin' tootin', highfalutin, son of a nun from Barcelona, a little old farm boy Joe. And he just delivered it absolutely perfect. Yeah. The whole I, setup for that was brilliant. I used to love all of those police are looking for. The, yeah. A lorry load of cement has collided with a prison van. <laughs> police are looking for hardened criminals, that one. That's a good one. Yeah. And a lorry, what is it, a ship containing red paint has collided with a ship containing blue paint. Survivors have been marooned. Marooned, yeah. <laughs> I love all those. Um, Anise, I don't think I... Did I ask you to bring anything along? Because you, have you been sitting there thinking, he never asked me to bring anything on, I haven't got anything. Oh, I don't have anything to bring along that... Mm -hmm. I don't know, yeah. <laughs> but just tell me about that marvellous that marvellous background you've got there. Is that... It looks very sort of uh, Japanese, is it? Yes, yes, it's, room, it's a room divider. It has a Japanese theme. And it's just a block laundry, really. <laughs> <laughs> How exotic. It's just How to blow the finesse. You could have really big that up then. <laughs> yeah. So are, you in your, are you in your laundry room then? Or are you... <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm in the bedroom. <laughs> You're in the bedroom? In the study. We have a second room that's a study. But yeah, cat sleeps behind me and, you know, just to, just to make it tidy. I don't have a green screen background. No, I now I I can't decide. So where are we with green screens? Because I quite like them. Because obviously for this it's quite nice. Mm. But then you know when you see people that suddenly you know suddenly in San Fran you know if I suddenly put San Francisco up, I think it's a bit inauthentic. You know. Yeah. Or I, I I was on a call the other day with someone that had space behind them, and I thought you're not in space, are you? You're just <laughs> pretending. But I, the nice thing I like. Nice about yeah, you're not, you're not in space, you're in Isleworth. You're just a silly, <laughs> pretend space. You're not the Messiah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm quite quite pleased we haven't been green screen bombed, actually, because my daughter has joined in a couple of PSA meetings when I haven't had my virtual background, wearing her bright green hoodie hmm. that Zoom then decides is a virtual background. <laughs> oh, I've had that. Yeah, I've got a green mug. So, I sometimes forget, and then you're drinking it. And... Yeah. Ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. Actually, that, that, that screen you've got there, Sue, if it was Chris Davidson on the call, it probably would look authentic because where, where he is sort of further around. I'm still not towards... sure West Kirby could carry the palm yeah. trees. Do you not think so, no? You've not seen Chris's sunset posts that he keeps putting I've seen things. lots of Chris's lovely sunset posts. Hmm. Stop talking about people that everyone doesn't know. This Sorry. Is... What have you? Oh, you've got a, a, some imaginary friend, some made up friend. Lives, lives on the park. Made up friend. Made up friend called Chris. Only us can see us. We don't know who Chris is, so stop talking about him. But he lives by the seaside. Yeah, I do actually know Chris. Um, but the nice thing is, uh, Anise, if you've got a green screen, you never have to tidy up again because look how tidy my office is. And then, it, <laughs> and I had to stop using this one because there's a. I'm turning around to see what the books are called. And they're not there. <laughs> Um, yes, 
<laughs> I'll just get one down for you. But there's one, <laughs> one that says something like medieval history. And I think, well, I haven't got that, have I? So I tend to use that one a bit more, which is a bit further away. Ooh. That does look quite fancy. Well, the, I had the opposite. The start of lockdown, I was doing all my Zooming actually in my library. And several people said, oh, where did you get your background? I was like, that's my house. <laughs> <laughs> It's, but it's amazing you, you can put anything behind you and people believe it you know I, I've, I've put that behind me <laughs> yes join me in Johannesburg and they'll go in Johannesburg? yes <laughs> you know, really not, it's just a flag isn't it I've just I've literally just, oh I'm in Germany now crikey this it's so easy to get about isn't it so there we are right um, just a couple of other things I want to ask you and then we need to get out of here um, masks in shops let's have a heated debate Sue masks in shops yes or no if I can find one that doesn't make my glasses steamed up, I will be thrilled. Otherwise, my shopping trips are going to get progressively shorter. Right. If you wear a mask uh, and your glasses steam up, you may be entitled to condensation. <laughs> <laughs> Only if you be missile PPE. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, I worked on PPE. <laughs> <laughs> Did you? Good. Um, that, that's something to do with mis-selling bank stuff, isn't it? Yeah, we don't. It let's was. not. There's no comedy material in that. I'm trying to think no. what else. I'm, I was because what's politics, philosophy, and economics? That's PPE as well, isn't it? When like posh people at Oxford, Oxbridge do that, don't they? <laughs> PPE. Uh, no, I don't think there's any mileage in that at all. <laughs> apart from me, perhaps losing a few gigs with some posh banks if I have a go at them because they might have done it. Peter, masks, yes or no? Well, it's funny you should mention banks, really, Jam, because um, <laughs> masks in shops, yeah, not so bad. Masks in banks, they've always had a little bit of a, an, an aversion to them. And uh, and you've got to feel sorry for bank robbers. You know, do, do they have to wear two now? You know, do they have to go in with, like, their Ronald Reagan mask on and their NHS mask go over the top and try and be under... <laughs> you know, it's, it just doesn't work the same. You know, they're the hidden victims of the uh, coronavirus. When we didn't really know much about coronavirus, in early March, I was in a bank in Richmond. Um, that's Richmond, London, not, not the made-up one in Yorkshire. The real one, Richmond, <laughs> on Thames. Um, I know the other one's the original one, but, you know, we're so London-centric. Um, and I was in this bank, and these uh, two people came in wearing masks, and, and everyone looked a bit apprehensive. <laughs> because of, you know, what? and then they said, this is a stick-up, and everyone just relaxed. <laughs> yeah. So that just turns out to be a joke, not a proper story. Anise, what's your take on masks? I'm def I prefer masks in, in shops as well because it makes other people feel safe too. Because uh, when they, because you can see, like where I live there during lunchtime, a lot of elderly people are shopping, and you know, you want to make them feel comfortable. So I'm for all for it. Um. Oh, I've, I've now said I'm, I haven't got any background at all. I don't like that. There we go. Um, and I went to the vet today in Richmond, the real one, not the one in Yorkshire. And um, they all had masks on and they wouldn't let me in. But I said, I brought Jimmy, um, who's he's a dog. He's not a person. And for, just for his six month checkup. And they said, you can't come in. And I went, this has not been explained. And they said, no, it's, it's fine. You just have to stay outside and we'll have a look at him for 15 minutes and then we'll call you uh, if there's any problems. And I went, well, there's quite a few things I need to tell you about because he's got a bit of a cataract and he might be a bit of gum disease because he's nine, you know. Uh, but anyway, it worked quite well, except that when they rang me on the phone, I'm right next to the South Circular. I don't, you, you won't know what that is, but it's a very busy road that we have in that London. And uh, like six <laughs> lanes of it, six lanes of it. And they're going, yes, his teeth. I go, what? What? Yeah, his teeth, uh, he's got a little bit of tartar, but and I, all right, when do we need to get that? So, no, you'll be fine for the next six month checkup, but it might need doing then. And I thought, this is bizarre. You know, we, you could, you can, I'd, I'd been watching football matches with people playing with no mark. And in the vets, they had masks on and I still wasn't allowed in. I had to be out in the traffic, risking my lives on one of the most polluted corners in London to try and save my dog's teeth. And I thought, what sort of world? Sorry, I've gone on a bit of a rant there, haven't I? Do you think they're just a bit naturally antisocial and they're using it as an excuse? No, I'm not having one of those. Then if they started talking social distancing and your vets team's going, yes! <laughs> yes. It's, it, is it true, Jim, that there's, there's a north circular road as well, isn't there? But people in London just don't know where it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, there is a north circular road and it turns into the south circular road. And, and guess where it turns into it? At the river. Because that's the thing. 
north or south. But the trouble is in the bit where I live in southwest London, the, the river's not really north or south. You know, you're not either north or south of it because the river's well, it actually goes, flowing. You watch East Enders, it goes everywhere, doesn't it? The east, east or west, and I live west of it, but I'm actually in the north bit. It doesn't make any sense. Just before we go, I want one last story from you, Peter, about going to Plymouth on a motorbike. <laughs> well, I was going to Spain and Portugal with a group of friends on our motorbikes, all set off, very well planned trip. And I'd just come back from another holiday, so I had knew my passport was where it should be, picked it out of the box that it always had, had my driving license inside, so I knew that's my passport. Drove all the way to Plymouth, kept checking, yep, got my passport, got my money, got all the way to the Brittany Ferries box office, took my passport out, and there is my wife looking back at me. Oh no. And so after a bit of a meltdown um, and a bit of an arrangement with Brittany Ferries to, uh, to see when the later ferry was that night, whether I could get back all the way to Birmingham uh, to meet my sister-in-law who was going to drive down from Liverpool to meet me and swap passports, I did. So I, I spent 600 miles on the bike that day. It crippled me. But the good news is I then got back to Portsmouth with half an hour to, spend, uh, to, to spare before jumping on the Portsmouth to Bilbao Ferry instead of the Plymouth Santander Ferry. And I met my friends the next day, having missed only half a day. But it was a very traumatic day. That's a <laughs> long time to be on a motorbike. Oh. Crikey. And just before we go, and uh, let's have one last story from you about connecting with a stranger. So we were in, um, on holiday in Japan and my wife learnt, um, she'd been studying Japanese, so she'd learnt like a handful of words. So we went to this cute little village, quaint village, three hours outside of Tokyo. And it was, one, it was surrounded by rice fields. And there was just one little street where the residents decided to do, it, to do it up and then try and attract tourists. So it was a very, just literally one little street, very traditional sort of, you know, buildings and so on. And we stayed in this traditional rest house. So no one spoke English. So my wife, we were getting by with my wife just speaking a handful of words. So we went for a walk and we saw this lovely little rice field and we saw this little old lady and in, in a Japanese lady. So she must have been 90 million years old. Right. And uh, she's pottering around. Lovely. So I, I can't resist talking to them. So I just said, you know, and then she started saying words and Jen was recognizing words and she would say words and then she would say, I'm living in this multi-generational house, all in Japanese. And then suddenly she said, we said we're from London. So she said, she pointed to me and she said, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. So I, I started singing it. And then she pointed to Jen, my wife, row, row, row your boat. So we were harmonizing. And then she started singing, row, row, row your boat, just a little harmony. And that was that. And it was the most delightful thing. And it's, a, and it's such a lovely tune, isn't it? It was good that it you is, yeah. a good one. <laughs> Unless you're watching Dirty Harry, when it's not quite so nice. <laughs> Fantastic. What a lovely story to finish with. We're out of time. Thank you so much for all joining me. My guests tonight have been the good, the bad and the ugly. I'll let you work out which ones. <laughs> 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 nice ones, yeah. I love that. <laughs> yeah. I thought of that about five minutes ago and I thought, can I get away with that? Because obviously it's, it'll be fine to say Peter's the ugly one, but which one of the two ladies will I say is the bad one? Thought, I'll, just, I'll just sit on the fence and just say you decide which they are. It's a good job we're 200 miles away, you know. Yeah. <laughs> brilliant. Okay, thank you so much for joining us. Have a brilliant evening. Thank you, Joe. Great thank job. Thank you. I loved it. Good night.